Hi, I am Richard Westerby and welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast. Today, we are here with one of the most famous egg donor and surrogacy lawyers in the world, Molly O'Brien. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. (laughs) You're welcome, Molly. I've had the privilege of knowing Molly for many years. Molly, you're the former chair of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine Legal Group, a member of the American Bar Association, and you've just been voted the president of the Society of Ethics and Egg Donor and Surrogacy Organization. That's a lot. Yes, it is a lot. And in addition, you're a partner at the International Fertility Law Group, which is a law firm in the US. So, Molly, can you explain to me why anyone looking at this process in the United States needs a lawyer at all? Oh, definitely. The first thing I'd like to state is that I'm really happy to be here. I've been listening to your podcast and it is fantastic. Thanks. (laughs) The attorney's part in this whole process is really important because the attorney that works with the intended parents is their their independent, non-biased guidance post. Everybody else that's working with the intended parents throughout this is working with them and their egg donor or them and their surrogate. The lawyer's that one independent person who's designed just for those intended parents. So it's a crucial part of having good advice throughout the whole process, I think. So good independent legal advice, Mm -hmm. always a benefit. Does that then mean you work with the agencies and the clinics or do you just work with the intended parents? That's a great question. So the lawyer is hired by the intended parents and works on behalf of the intended parents. But part of the lawyer's job is to be part of that team and to be able to work in a collaborative manner with their agency and with their clinic but representing the interest of the parents. If I were to have something that I needed to be dealt with, I could come to you if I didn't feel comfortable enough going to someone else to talk about it, for example. Absolutely, yep. Oh, amazing. That's good to know, guys. So you work with the agencies, you work with the clinics. With regards to egg donation, how does that work? Okay. So egg donation, I can break it down for you into four steps. The first step would be choosing an egg donor and matching with her. Once you've picked the donor that you want to work with, you should let your agency or your clinic know that you've selected this donor so that they can take her off of that database and make her unavailable to other parents. When you say match with an egg donor, you can do that. As we know, if you listen to the previous episode, you can do that through your IVF clinic. You can do it through an egg donor agency, or you can do it through a friend or a family. Exactly. And they're all treated the same legally. Yes, in terms of what you need to do legally. Yeah. But the contract will be a little bit different if it's a friend or family member. Well, yeah. Ah, I like <laughs> we'll the get idea. There. We'll get to on that one. Brilliant. That's step one. Okay. Is so. selecting the donor, and then you will need to set up a trust account for any compensation she's going to be paid and to cover her screening costs and so forth. So that's step one. Once you've done that, then step two, the donor will go to your IVF doctor and she will be screened. They will do a medical screening, they will do a psychological screening, and they will do a genetic screening to make sure that she's an appropriate candidate for you. Once those screenings are done, then step three is where your attorney would come in. That's when the contract between you and the egg donor is done. But hang on a sec. So you're saying you find someone, you medically screen them, and then you sign a contract? Why wouldn't you sign a contract? You find someone, you sign, you lock her in. You're like, we're working together. Why wait? So the reason why you should wait and do the contract is because, first of all, we don't want you to have to pay lawyers. And second of all, we don't want you to be under a legal written agreement with somebody if we don't even know if she can be your donor yet. So oh. we do the screenings first, and then we do the contract. Interesting. Yes. And then once the contracts are done, step four is the actual egg retrieval, the medical procedure. Ah, okay. So there we go. So step one, matching. Step two, screening. Step three, legal contract. Step four, then basically onto the clinic, right? Yes. Amazing. Talking about the legal contracts themselves, mm-hmm. what goes into an egg donor legal contract? It's really interesting because the egg donation legal contract is very straightforward and much easier to understand than a surrogacy contract, for example. Egg donation is considered a property right in the United States. What? Yes. Eggs are property. It's not a parental right that we're dealing with. So the moment each egg leaves the donor's body, it becomes the personal property of the intended parents. And they can do whatever they want with those eggs. They can make embryos. They can freeze embryos. They can use a surrogate. They have all the rights in the world. 
And the egg donor has no rights on those at all. That's exactly. Her rights terminate with a properly drafted contract, that is, (laughs) the moment the egg leaves her body. Crikey. I did not know that. So then what happens, say, for example, if I create embryos, Mm -hmm. like I did, right? Mm -hmm. I created six embryos, Mm -hmm. used two, have four frozen. Does she, she have, there's no rights, nothing. They're mine. Mm -hmm. None. Her rights end the moment the egg leaves her body. Amazing. Okay. What else goes into that legal contract? So the egg donation contract is really focused mostly on the donor. The only responsibility that the parents really have in the contract is to make sure that the donor's compensated. And they took care of that in step one when they set up that trust account and put money aside for her. So the contract is really focused on her following medical orders, taking the medications correctly, going to her appointments. And it will cover, of course, the costs and expenses, which will be limited, should be limited in the contract. And it will cover a donor liability insurance policy for her. Ooh. Ooh. What does that mean? Ah, any agency or clinic that accepts a donor to come in for a donation procedure will likely place one of these policies. It'll be placed, it depends on who is driving the bus in that case. This is a policy that will cover the donor if she has an adverse reaction to medication, if there's a complication with the procedure. This protects the parents because then they don't have to pay out of pocket for her medical expenses if this happens. But it also protects the donor because this is a voluntary thing. So her own medical insurance may not cover any of those kind of costs. So it's basically a health insurance policy in case just specific to donors. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And that goes from when till when? Like covers what? It usually covers until she's cleared after the egg retrieval procedure. Oh wow! Okay. Did not know that. And then, of course, in the donation contract, there will be a discussion about whatever type of relationship that the parties have agreed to have whether it's an anonymous donation or some sort of open donation. Okay, okay, brilliant. So it's almost like you have a standardized dish contract, Mm -hmm. but then there are bits that you would then tailor to the situation that you have. Okay, fine. So as we know from a previous episode, there are three types of egg donor. You've got an anonymous egg donor, a semi-open or a semi-known donor, and then an open or a known donor. What are the differences contractually for those three things? Anonymous egg donors mean that nobody will know who the other party is. There will be no names or information disclosed or contact in the future. That's what both parties are expecting and anticipating. The semi-open or directed donations or open donations, they're pretty similar, to be honest with you. And most agencies or clinics that do these types of donations write their own ticket in terms of exactly what that means. But by and large, what I see is that semi-open anticipates a disclosure of first names and an ability for parties to contact one another, but not necessarily have full information about one another and not necessarily have a video call or meet in person. Whereas an open or known or fully directed donation would indicate that there might be some sort of video call together or perhaps even a meeting in person. But the truth is, With a semi-open, you can always do that if everybody wants to. If you find that you have something in common, there's nothing preventing you as long as both parties agree. And the converse is true, too. If at any point one party is uncomfortable with the contact, or if they just don't want to reply to contact, you have the right to withdraw your consent to any contact. We can't force a donor to communicate with parents. We cannot force parents to communicate with a donor. Interesting. So you could, in effect sign a contract with a donor that is an open contract, but then lose contact with her because she decides not to. Exactly. So obviously I went through this process 12 years ago where things like 23andMe weren't around, social media wasn't around, Mm -hmm. AI to be able to find people wasn't available. What would be the situation if, for example, I had signed an anonymous egg donation contract And my child gets to age 12, 13, 14, whatever it is, and they go online and find the egg donor and then reach out. What happens there? There's a huge move in the industry to no longer have anonymous donations for several reasons. One is that it's simply a farce to believe that anything's anonymous anymore because of these Ancestry.com, 23andMe, just like you mentioned. But also a lot of donors use their social media pictures as their donation profile pictures. And it's extremely easy to figure out who they are for the parents. And honestly, I feel like a lot of donors really want to 
know that they've helped somebody be successful. They want some level of contact. They don't want to infiltrate the parents' lives. They don't want somebody who's going to be contacting them obsessively. That's not what they're looking for. And I think that's what a lot of parents are afraid of mm-hmm. when it comes to semi-open or open. Yeah, They're just looking to be available to the child or children and to the parents if there's any issues that come up. And they want to know that things are going well. Yeah. I get, well, it's like in my case, every year, once a year around the Christmas time, I send our donor a summary of what we've done this year and and she replies with the summary of what she's done that year with her family it's wonderful and sharing a picture too sharing pictures yeah yeah see that's what i normally see too and i think that's what this is really turning towards i think that's where we're going to end up and i think that a really good way to start that sort of a relationship with your donor is to send a handwritten thank you card and a small gift to your clinic ahead of time so that when the donor goes in for the retrieval procedure when she wakes up from the anesthesia Whoever the nurse is can hand her this little, not expensive, but something meaningful gift from the parents and this little thank you card that just makes it a little bit more warm and kind. And it makes it more than just names on a contract, which is cold. And that will help keep her heart and her mind warm and open to communication in the future. What an amazing idea. If you're out there thinking about doing egg donation, make sure you buy your egg donor a little present. That's really quite a nice idea. And we touched on it briefly. You said if you're having a contract with a family member or a friend, that's going to be slightly different. Right. Why? Because any active familial relationship where you're in the child's life as an aunt or something like that, there's a different layer that is added to a donation. So we would always want to make additional disclosures in the contract that say something like, even though you will be at family events with this child, you will watch this child grow up, you will be close and you will hold a special place in their life. That should never be translated to mean that you're a legal parent as a donor. Interesting. Cause that was always one of my, so my best friend offered her eggs and uh, uh, w- which was amazing. And to this day, I still, smile whenever I think about it but I've always wanted that I wanted 100% to be the parent Mm -hmm. and I guess that would have then been taken care of in that that contract Mm -hmm. wow that's interesting I think this has been absolutely fascinating Molly you are a superstar as always if anybody has any questions then please feel free to send them through to us we are here and we will answer them and we may even make Molly our resident legal expert who Mm -hmm. knows watch this space Thank you so much, Molly. Thanks for having me.